Hi, everybody. I'm going to start this session now. It's going to be a little bit crazy because uh, we'll see how this works. Okay. Um, let's begin here with Camus and his definition of the absurd on page 189 of Myth of Sisyphus. In a universe suddenly divested of illusions and lights, man feels an alien, a stranger. His exile is without remedy since he is deprived of the memory of a lost home or the hope of a promised land. This divorce between man and his life, the actor and his setting, is properly the feeling of absurdity. And here I think some of you will notice some of this phrasing, right? Um, especially a stranger, um, a nod to the title of his famous novel. And I think we can see how Mirceau himself was divested of illusions. More than any other character in the novel, he didn't believe that his life necessarily had meaning. He didn't necessarily think that there was a way he was supposed to be living his life. Um, and even love and affection, all of that, he was sort of skeptical about its um, importance. So we can kind of see that also at the end, even at the end facing death, he did not have hope of a promised land. Um, he could have, right, uh, started to believe in a heaven in order to avoid death, in order to like cheat death, to believe in a heaven or an afterlife, but he refused. Um, this divorce between man and his life, the actor and his setting, and uh, for some of you too, you might have been thinking here, actor in a setting and, and maybe making a connection with six characters in search of an author. Um, all right, so when can this feeling of absurdity, when does it begin, when does it arise? And Camus answers, any moment. As Camus says, at any street corner, the feeling of absurdity can strike any man in the face. That's on page 190. Um, recall that absurdity or absolute absurdity is the meaningless of, well, you know, everything. Um, and some of you might be recalling Anna in love and how she was going sort of through the motions, living her life, and suddenly she sees a blind man chewing gum and that the absurd just sort of smacks her right in the face. And she sort of has this, what we would call an existential crisis at that moment. Um, for us, rising, driving to work, four hours in an office or in class, meal, back to work for four hours, driving back home, meal, sleep. And now, even in this pandemic, I think this is even more absurd, right? We wait, we don't even get dressed, and we stumble to our computers and do some of our work. I mean, this idea of our lives being sort of like this repetition, I think, is highlighted even more during this pandemic. As Camus writes, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, according to the same rhythm, this path is easily followed most of the time. But one day the why arises. I don't know about you, but this, when the why arises for me is usually about three o'clock in the morning uh, when I can't sleep, right? <laughs> like why, what's the purpose of all this? Why am I doing this? And everything begins and the weariness tinged with amazement. There you go. Um, for Camus, he, he writes, weariness comes at the end of the acts of a mechanical life. I think this is a really interesting phrase, mechanical life, the life that's just sort of like robotic-like, that most of us aren't even really involved in some of these choices. We get up, we dress, we walk, we work, we interact with other people without necessarily being fully conscious. Um, but at the same time, it inaugurates the impulse of consciousness. At the end of the awakening comes in time the consequence, suicide or recovery. Of course, he's talking about the awakening, the awareness that our lives are very mechanical, the awareness that is there a point to all of this. That awareness of the absurd, there's a consequence, right? Um, either we think this life is so hard and it's so weary and there's no point, so we might as well end it, or perhaps a recovery. And what does that look like for Camus? How do most of us deal with this awakening? This sort of like, what's the point of all of this? We think to ourselves, in the future, things will be better, right? I will understand why in the future. All of this will have a point sometime in five years, 10 years. Um, and especially, I'm going to say, when I was your age at 19 or 20, whenever I felt life was really weary, I thought, well, it'll make sense later. <laughs> you know, Maybe my life will be happier later. Maybe I'll have more meaning when I'm older. Um, then Camus says, but then one day, Camus says around 30, and I would say even the older you get, this becomes even more true. 
a person realizes she stands at a certain point on the curve in time, that she belongs to time. We want to think about that in terms of, you know, especially my age, I'm middle age. That means most likely I have lived more than I will in the future. I have reached the edge where, as he writes, I belong to time. <laughs> I no longer, you know, have more time to, I'm, I've got less time than I had before. And that is a really, really eerie realization, even though, of course, we all know we could die at any point, but still this idea of if I lived as long as I've lived right now, I'd be very lucky. Okay. Uh, tomorrow, she was longing for tomorrow, whereas everything in her ought to reject that. We ought to reject this idea that somehow things are going to be better tomorrow. We should reject this hope of a better tomorrow because believing somehow that our lives will be meaningful later in the future, maybe like in heaven, like this is a really awful life, but in heaven it's going to be better, is running away from or denying the absurdity of our lives, right? So if you are like kind of in despair right here, like, well, it's going to get better someday, that that for Camus is not the answer to recognizing this absurdity. Yeah. And because to live this way is denying that death can happen at any time. And that's also the truth. This idea, well, it'll be better tomorrow, is kind of putting off to some degree that our lives are very temporary, very transient things. Um, as Camus writes, it was previously a question of finding out whether or not, not life had to have meaning to be lived. This is a really profound statement to me. It was previously a question of finding out whether or not life had to have meaning to be lived. It now becomes clear on the contrary, that it will be lived all the better if it has no meaning. And many of you are probably scratching your heads and saying that absolutely makes no sense. How can it be that life is lived all the better if it has no meaning? Well, let's see how he answers that. Revolt. And I know you saw this word quite a bit in Myth of Sisyphus, so let's kind of try to define that. Revolt is the conscious acknowledgement, the embracing, the opening yourself up to. Remember, Merceau talks about that, opening himself up to the indifference of the universe, right? Opening yourself up to and recognizing the absurdity, utter meaninglessness of our existence and not running away from it. That, for Camus, is right there. That's the answer opening yourself up to the indifference, not trying to run away from it. Camus tells us to, abol to abolish conscious revolt is to elude the problem. So to fall back into a pattern, to numb yourself to absurdity, that is, try to drown it in drugs and alcohol, sex, video games, Netflix. Tiger King is what I'm kind of trying to avoid my absurdity right now. That isn't the answer. To try to convince yourself existence isn't absurd by embracing a worldview that tells you you are here for a reason found in many religious traditions, that's not the answer either. Neither is giving into your despair and committing suicide. For Camus, that is not the answer either. And that might have surprised some of you. You might have sort of thought, you know, if life is meaningless, it doesn't matter if you commit suicide or not. And that is not Camus' response. For Camus, the answer is this. Living is keeping the absurd alive. Keeping it alive, all above all, contemplating it. The absurd dies only when we turn away from it. Revolt is constant confrontation between man and his own obscurity. That's what it means to revolt. Doesn't mean to fight it. Doesn't mean to say, oh, this can't possibly it be, you know, it. Um, Instead, revolt is a constant confrontation between man and his own absurd, uh, obscurity and the absurdity of life. It is an insistence upon an impossible transparency. It challenges the world anew every second. Revolt is not aspiration, for it is devoid of hope. That revolt is the certainty of a crushing fate without the resignation that ought to accompany it. And this, to me, is really, really important. So I want to read this again. Revolt challenges the world anew every second. Revolt is not aspiration for it is devoid of hope. When you revolt, you're not saying, I hope it's gonna be better someday. I hope that my life will have meaning. That revolt is the certainty of a crushing fate. But, 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 we know that our fate is crushing. We know that we will die. We know that our lives won't have any intrinsic meaning. 
but we don't find it, feel resigned with that realization. We don't feel overcome by that realization. We don't fall into a sort of suicidal despair. Many believe that if one were to admit, recognize that life is absurd, devoid of objective outside meaning, that suicide should logically follow. After all, if life is meaningless and also just so damn hard, why keep on living? Camus argues that such people believe wrongly. Suicide, however, is a person settling with the absurd, ex accepting it or resigning oneself to it. But the absurd cannot be settled. A person who commits suicide is in a way trying to finish the absurd, to end how absurd life is. But the absurd escapes suicide to the extent that it is simultaneously awareness and rejection of death. You can't end absurd. You don't suddenly give your life meaning by committing suicide. You don't end it. You don't end it. The only way to end the absurd is to reject death. By rejection of death here, I don't think that Camus is saying a person should deny that death is going to happen or somehow think that he or she can escape death. That's not what he means by rejecting death. Okay. Um, what he means is that in even the very moments before death, a person should still be living and experiencing the world around him or her. Think about Mirceau's mom, close to death, wanting to experience love. Think about Mirceau himself, you know, when he is lying in the cell and he is looking at the stars and he is feeling the air around him and the, my cat is biting my foot. Hi, hi Sherlock, can you please stop that? Yeah, stop biting my foot. Um, here, <laughs> reject death, reject death. Okay, sorry. Um, so here, you know, Merceau, even right before he's going to be beheaded, you can see that he is still there in his life. He is still living as much as he can in those moments before his death, even in recognizing the hate ow, of the, <laughs> the viewers around him, right? That he's not going to sort of close his eyes or pretend or experience a different reality. He wants to be in that moment as much as he possibly can, to be in that moment alive until the very last moment when the blade cuts through his spinal cord. Sorry, was that really, that was kind of graphic. Um, yeah, cat, go away. Sherlock, seriously. Um, and then here, uh, okay. Uh, and I think he would argue that a condemned person, a person directly, immediately facing death that is forced upon him or her, has perhaps the most potential to actually be living. Metaphorically, rejecting death, right? That a person who knows that death is coming is in the perfect position to be the one to reject it. He writes, the contrary of suicide, in fact, is the man condemned to death. That's on page 183. And uh, so what, if anything, gives life value? The revolt. Remember what the revolt is. Being aware of the absurdity of life, not running away from it, and living anyway. <laughs> That's a good day. That's a great day, um, which really helps me sometimes, especially when I'm a little bit depressed or during this pandemic, like what makes a good day? Knowing all of this is completely absurd. Ow, cat, <laughs> this cat is helping me. Um, knowing this life is completely absurd and waking up and doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. That's it, that's a good day. And paradoxically for Camus, the absurd teaches us not to make the mistake of valuing certain kinds of lives and their experiences of our other kinds of lives. So I know some of you are like, you know, it doesn't matter how long you live, it means how deep you live, how meaningful you live. And Camus like, uh-uh, <laughs> no. Like just recognizing the absurdity and breathing in and out, that matters. There is no hierarchy of like, oh, you lived life better because you had, you were married and had children, or you lived life worse because you were a single person. You know, there is none of that hierarchy of, <laughs> hierarchy of like valuable lives, right? Um, for him, the quantity, the number of years we live, trumps quality, how we live them. Um, and to me, this gives me a lot of solace whenever I'm depressed or I've been, I think, a solace to a depressed person that uh, <laughs> one who's not afraid of death, but maybe one who's afraid that life is too long. Uh, this kind of idea, like the Oprah kind of idea of like every moment should be filled with happiness and joy and intimacy and real living. 
that is very depressing indeed, right? Like, especially in these moments of the pandemic. Like sometimes, you know, I get this sort of message of like, oh, you know, people are really connecting with each other. And I'm like, really? Because I talked to my dad on the phone and I don't feel any more connected to him than I did before, you know? So this idea of somehow your life is more meaningful if it's deep and there's joy and everything else. Um, give me one second. Cat, I'm gonna put you underneath here. Go, go away, go away, go away. Sorry, okay. He's, um, I don't know why, he really likes my foot this morning. Uh, he's gonna come back, okay. Um, it doesn't, there is no idea here that, that somehow your life only has meaning if every moment is filled with this kind of joy and, and uh, happiness. Mm -mm 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 -mm. What Camus is talking about is that moment in love when Anna held that moment like a butterfly in her fingers. She was there in that moment. That's what counts. And it doesn't matter if you're in your stinky bedroom at home. If you're there experiencing in that moment, that's revolt. You know, that's, that's good. <laughs> if you are maybe in uh, a beautiful mountain setting in the top of Colorado, fine, as long as you're there and aware of it. Maybe, maybe not taking a selfie with your phone to prove to your Facebook friends that you're someplace beautiful. Does that make sense? Like, it doesn't matter where you are. It's the matter, it's not, it's not the, you know, like remember Kierkegaard? It's not the what, it's the how. So it doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't matter what you're doing, it's the how you're doing it. So you can be in your bedroom, surrounded by your dirty clothes and your books and your work, but if you're in that moment, that's meaningful because you're in that moment, because you're aware of the absurdity and you're aware that you're breathing in and out. For Camus, that's all that counts. Um, here, being aware of one's life, one's revolts, one's freedom into the maximum is living into the maximum. That's all it takes being aware of the absurd, being aware that you're aware of it, being aware of your freedom, that's living, that's living. Every day that we live, that we are aware of the absurd and still just keep breathing is a valuable day. No matter how much suffering there was or joy or happiness or sorrow, there is no life that is higher than that for Camus. How does Mirceau then, after, um, even after he's been sentenced to the guillotine, revolt? He could have accepted the chaplain's pleas to ask God for help. And um, the chaplain tells him, every man I have known in your position has turned to him, God. Um, that's on page 117 of The Stranger. He could have turned towards religion, given himself a reason, a purpose for his life and death. He could have believed the chaplain that there was something after this life to hope for. Instead, he confronts the absurd on page 121 and 122. So if we go to The Stranger on those pages, you can notice that he absolutely confronts the absurd when he's yelling in that rage with the chaplain. chaplain. And he, he says, you know, there is nothing, nothing of this mattered. It doesn't matter, none of it. There is no reason for any of this. At least he's aware of that, the chaplain isn't, but mere so is. And then this is when he gets to this realization that everyone is privileged. In our discussion board the other day, I wrote how what he means by this, everybody is privileged, is that you know, when we think about how crazy it is that we're all here, you know, breathing in and out, that there are so many different ways that we didn't have to be here, that this life doesn't have to be the way it is, that this earth doesn't have to be the way it is. I mean, it is so crazy, the number of specific criteria that had to be in place just for this earth to exist, and then for humans to exist, and then not only humans, but you and me, and, and not only that, but at the same time, so we can be taking this class together, it's astronomical. Um, and just to be aware of that is, makes us, you know, should, we should be aware of our own privilege. We're here, we're breathing in and out. It's completely absurd. There's no meaning to it, but we're privileged. Um, here then too, he uh, opens himself up to the indifference of the universe. He, uh, on page 122, with him gone, the chaplain, I was able to calm down again. I was exhausted and threw myself on the bunk. Um, when I woke up with the stars in my face, sounds of the countryside were drifting in, smells of night, earth, and salt air were cooling my temples. The wondrous peace of that sleeping summer flowed through me like a tide. Then in the dark hour before dawn, sirens blasted. They were announcing his death. 
You see that moment, he is there, he is alive, he's experiencing the world around him as it is, which he's always been really good at, hasn't he, Marceau? That, for Camus, that is revolt. He confronted the absurd, he didn't run away from the absurd, he didn't run to religion, he didn't run to God, he stayed, he didn't run away from his death. Um, but neither is he resigned, he is fully aware of his surroundings. He isn't resigned in the sense that he's no longer wants to live. He very much wants to live, even in the very last breath. And he wants to be aware of all the sensations around him, even the hate that's coming from the crowd, all of that. Um, so here, and in that absurdity, he wants to live, not die. He opens himself to up, he, up to it, he embraces it. So what does this have to do with Sisyphus? Sisyphus, of course, is the figure from Greek mythology. Um, who was ultimately condemned, right, to push this heavy boulder up a hill and then watch it as it went back down and then push the boulder up the hill and watch it as it went back down. That was his punishment. In the title essay of the myth of Sisyphus, Camus famously described our human lives as similar to the torturer Sisyphus, who was condemned to roll the stone, same stone, up the same hill just to have it roll down again over and over until the ten, end of time. Sisyphus was being punished in part because he had escaped the underworld once and lived some years enjoying life on earth. Now he is back in the underworld at his quintessentially meaningless task. Is there anything more meaningless than that? I mean, it doesn't even have to be a heavy boulder. Imagine if it were just a tiny rock, it would still be just as meaningless. Camus finds this absurd and he finds coping with the absurd heroic. Sisyphus perseveres and resists the lure of suicide. Camus holds that suicide tempts us with the illusory promise of freedom, but the only real freedom is to embrace the absurdity. And this is what he writes. You have already grasped that Sisyphus is the absurd hero. He is as much through his passions as through his torture. His scorn of the gods, his hatred of death, and his passion for life won him that unspeakable penalty in which the whole being is exerted toward accomplishing nothing. This is the price that must be paid for the passions of the earth. Camus asks us to fully imagine the huge effort Sisyphus must make, straining his body to push the huge stone a hundred times over. We must see his face screwed up with the effort of it, his cheek pressed up hard against the stone, his shoulder fully braced against its dirty surface, his foot wedging it to keep it from falling backward. And at the end of his tremendous effort, measured by skyless space and time without death, he is successful. Then he watches the boulder full, fall back down the hill in a matter of moments. Down he goes again to restart his toil. It is during that return, that pause in concerted effort, that Sisyphus most interests Camus. That time is when Sisyphus is most conscious. He is not distracted by his work, but he is fully facing the absurdity of his situation. At those moments, Camus writes, Sisyphus is superior to his face, fate and he is superior to his rock. He is stronger than his rock. Um, I don't know how many of you have this moment. Maybe it's in the quiet moment between classes when you're sitting down under a tree somewhere on campus and you're thinking, oh, this is just kind of absurd. And you take a deep breath and you notice the air on your face and you notice the feel of the earth underneath you and you get up and you go to the next class. That right there, that's that moment when you're most conscious, right? Um, we are stronger than our rock. Sisyphus in the rock can be a person in his or her tedious, repetitive work, but the rock is also life itself. Even if there is no task to perform that is as onerous as the labor of Sisyphus, every day must be born, and the reward for bearing it is another day. Still, Camus sees reason to rejoice as well as weep. He says that it is in the descent of our rolled up rock that we are most aware of our predicament. If the descent is thus sometimes performed in sorrow, it can also take place in joy. The world is not too much. The chief sorrow, he tells us, was in the beginning. Now, when images of better times with images of better times, like Sisyphus' re recollection of earth, become dominant in one's mind, and when the desire for happiness becomes too much to resist, melancholy rises in a person's heart and grief is too heavy to bear. Even this grief has an antidote, crushing truth. Truths perish from being acknowledged. Um, isn't this also true, everyone out there? Don't you think? 
if you have a crushing truth in your life, and it might be about the depth of your despair, it might be something to do with your parents or something to do with your friends or your loneliness, the only way to overcome that is to acknowledge it. Forcing it away, pretending it's not there, getting on Facebook to convince yourself you've got friends, that, that's not the answer. Acknowledging it is the answer. So when that melancholy rises, when it feels it's too heavy to bear, acknowledge it. That's what Camus advises. Sif Sisyphus is exhausted, but he continues. He even continues well. His fate belongs to him. His rock is his thing. The person who understands the absurdity of the human condition is strengthened by it. And this too gives me hope when I read Camus. I know it seems really, really dark, but this does give me hope that the person who understands the absurdity of the human condition is strengthened by it. He or she still has to work unceasingly to bear up under the weight of being, but it is worth it. It is worth it. There is no higher destiny, Camus declares. The absurd man is the master of his days. When he gazes backward over his life, he contemplates that series of unrelated actions which becomes his fate, created by him. And like Sisyphus and his rock, the whole seemingly unreasonable effort turns out to have meaning just because it constituted his life. So why does our lives have meaning? Because we get up and we keep going. That's it. It doesn't have to be because you won a Nobel Prize. It doesn't have to be because you accomplished something miraculous that you'll be remembered forever for ages. It's because you got up and you kept going. That's it. Thus, even while we are convinced that all human meaning comes from human beings and is not from outside of them, if we're existentialists, that, that is, that we create our own meaning, that there is an intrinsically meaning in our lives, that God doesn't give us a purpose, that the universe doesn't give us a purpose, we are still able to be impressed by its meaning if we allow ourselves to be. Camus says that each of us, like Sisyphus, is like a blind man who wants to see and yet knows that the night has no end, but who is still on the go. Even that blind man chewing gum, right? Meaning and joy are inherent in our simple yet heroically effortful persistence. The rock is still rowing, rolling, and we endure. That's it. He ends the essay with a famous passage that combines all his strange pessimism and optimism. And I know this is so paradoxical for some of us, right? This idea that the answer to our lives, how do our lives have meaning? Get up and keep living. That's it. That's where we find the meaning. I leave Sisyphus at the foot of the mountain. One always finds one's burden again. But Sisyphus teaches the higher fidelity that negates the gods and raises rocks. He too concludes that all is well. This universe, henceforth without a master, seems to him neither sterile nor futile. The struggle itself toward the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. It is not a simple kind of happiness, but Camus asks us to perceive that it is happiness all the time, all the same. For those who find life hard to bear, or perhaps for all of us when we find life hard to bear, Camus is an odd but wonderful companion, entirely empathizing with our despair, yet cheering us on, cheering us on to live, and even see a happiness in our struggle. Camus counsels a kind of revolt, which means for him that we must have knowledge of the certainty of our ultimate fate, death, but refuse to be resigned to it. It is a paradoxical revolt in the face of acceptance, a very tricky idea, but one which Camus feels sure we can manage, I hope, right? Um, this is why suicide is an anathema to his philosophy of the absurd experience. He says that people consider suicide the ultimate revolt, but the contrary is true. Life in the face of its pain, he writes, is the ultimate result, revolt. Suicide is acceptance in the extreme. Our challenge is to be aware of death and at the same time reject it. The tension between being keenly aware of death yet not being resigned to it is what creates the absurd and keeping the absurd alive keeps the person alive. Camus writes that it is essential that we do not die of our own free will because our embracing the absurd leads us to take all of life and give what we have. Suicide, he writes, is a repudiation. The absurd man can only drain everything to the bitter end and deplete himself. The absurd is his extreme tension, which he maintains constantly by solitary effort, for he knows that in the consciousness and in the day-to-day -day revolt, he, could, he gives proof of his only truth, which is defiance. All right, I hope that helped. Maybe.
I hope all of you take care and uh, yeah, good luck. I'm gonna try to end this thing. <laughs>